want to say good morning to you all. Thank you for that great response. Y'all know, as I mentioned to you the previous times I was here, I'm a product of the African American church. And the preaching moment uh, in the African American church is a dialogue rather than a monologue. So if y'all talk with me, I might cut this, the sermon a little bit shorter. <laughs> yeah, that, that always works <laughs> to get a couple of amens. Uh, Every time I'm here, I, I'm always impressed with the music. Um, so, Stu, again, uh, I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but thanks uh, for... Amen, amen, amen. That is very true. So thank you all uh, for your beautiful music on this morning. Uh, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, you are good. You are a God who is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You keep steadfast love for thousands. You forgive iniquity and transgression and sin. But you are a God who will by no means clear the guilty. And God... Since that is your character, we put our hope and our trust and our faith in you. So in this moment, we pray, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, speak, Lord. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, today we are going to be unpacking 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and also 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Again, that is 1 John, the second chapter, verses 15 through 17. And also, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. I hear a few pages still turning. All right, fewer pages. All right, no pages. This is the word of the Lord, so please listen carefully. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. I'll flip over to chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is Love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Love. Love. 
love. Love is ambiguous. Love is as confusing as it is heartwarming. Love in the right direction can bestow upon its object fountains overflowing with joy. But love in the wrong direction can leave us desolate of hope. We can love to love, but we can also love to hate. We can love God, our wives, our husbands, our children, but we can also love our pets. And we can love (laughs) Chick-fil-A. I love Chick-fil-A. Do you love Chick-fil-A? Amen. I love to read. Some of us love sports. Some of us love the gospel. Some of us love to gossip. Love is fickle. Love is hard. Kingdoms have gone to war for love. People have killed for love, but people have also laid down their lives for love. Passionate poems have been written about this thing called love. Listen to this poem by English Puritan Anne Bradstreet entitled, To My Dear and Loving Husband. If ever two were one, then surely we. If ever man were loved by wife, then thee. If ever wife was happy in a man, compare with me, ye women, if you can. I prize thy love more than whole mines of gold or all the riches that the East doth hold. My love is such that rivers cannot quench, nor aught but love from thee give recompense. Thy love is such I can no way repay. The heavens reward thee manifold, I pray. Then while we live in love, let's so persevere that when we live no more, We may live ever. It's interesting that that last line didn't rhyme. (laughs) Most of us have favorite love songs. Some of my favorite love songs are Love by an artist named Music Soul Child or I Am Ready for Love by India Ari. You should go check those out. Jackie DeShannon sang a song that said, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. But the queen of rock and roll, Tina Turner, was on to something when she asked the world the question back in 1984, what's love got to do with it? What's love but a secondhand emotion? Who needs a heart? when your heart can be broken. Now, that's a secular view of love, but gospel singer Anthony Evans sings, Love is willing to get hurt. Love gives, needing no return. Now, most people want to be loved, but some people reject love. There are love doctors Seriously, people have done PhDs on the psychology of love. Love is as much an action as it is an emotion. My brothers and sisters, if you haven't gotten it by now, today we're going to be talking about love. (laughs) Our two passages today present us with two exhortations and two promises concerning the placement of our affections. And as we unpack these verses, I want us all to do some deep introspection. Ask yourself, where do your affections lie? What does God's transcript of your passions say about your affections? The world and the things 
that the world has to offer battle for our affections. But as God's beloved children, we are called to love God and you are called to love people with radical and self-sacrificial love, a love that the triune creator of the cosmos gives us. I'm in verse number 15 of chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I'll be the first to admit that I do not live these verses perfectly. Here's a somewhat humorous example of how these verses have convicted me. I would love to lose all of the weight that I've gained during the pandemic. I'm going to step to the side and give a demonstration. I know that (laughs) popular suit etiquette is when you stand up. You're supposed to button your button. (laughs) This suit used to fit, (laughs) y'all. I would love to lose these pounds that I've gained during the pandemic. But I also love (laughs) Chick-fil-A. I love, funny enough, Crunch Berries and Fruity Pebbles, my favorite cereal. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Now, the reality is that I cannot indulge myself with sugary treats and fattening sweets and also love to have a somewhat decent figure in the mirror. In order to fully have one, I have to give up the other. And our our passage, our first passage, begins with an exhortation not to love the world neither the things in the world. John's exhortation carries the force of a command which demonstrates the seriousness of his exhortation. And what John means by the world and the things of the world are the systems of the world that find their origin in sin. So if your affections are for the sinful things of the world, then your affections cannot also be for the Father. The love of the Father, in verse 15, can be understood as love for the Father. Remember Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The things of the world and love for the Father are diametrically opposed because they have different origins. Let's look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from God the world. In John's estimation, the world only has three things to offer which arise ultimately from sin. The cravings of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life or the pride of possessions. Let's consider these three briefly. Uh, The cravings of the flesh refers to the general disposition of man to be tempted by sinful desires. It refers to man's lack of discipline to resist sin and man's weakness to resist indulging in things that are contrary to the will of God. The lust of the eye refers to the gateway for temptation and sin. And the Bible illustrates this perfectly for us in David's lust for Bathsheba. David saw Bathsheba with a lustful eye, which led him to commit some of the most heinous sin in all of the Bible. Now, the pride of life refers to man's tendency to find security and importance in material things rather than God. 
It can also be understood, again, as the pride of possession. And in James chapter 4, verse 16, the ESV simply calls it arrogance. It is a self-centered belief in what you have or in what you've accomplished for affirmation and significance. My brothers and sisters, again, if your affections are for these things, the cravings of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life, then the love of the Father is not in you. Because these things are outside of the loving nature of God. These things find their origin in the world. And although they may bring you temporary feelings of pleasure and euphoria... And temporary satisfaction, the feeling only lasts for a moment. People who have struggled with addiction of any kind know this well. That high, that feeling of euphoria only lasts for a moment. John also tells us that the world, along with what it has to offer, is passing away. Look at verse number 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. All right, my brothers and sisters, let's go to seminary for a moment. Because the Greek is helpful here. The phrase is passing away is actually only one word in the Greek text. It is a present passive indicative verb present passive indicative verb don't fear i'm going to explain that (laughs) it is a verb so of course that means that action is happening it is a present verb which means that the action is ongoing or continuous it is a passive verb which means that the object is not doing the action rather it is receiving the action it is being acted upon The object, in our case, which is receiving the action, is the world. It is an indicative verb, which essentially signifies a statement of fact. Now, the ESV translates this word as concisely as possible with the phrase, is passing away. It's a great translation. But this can also be understood that the world is continuously being acted upon, causing it to pass away. My brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to tell you is that the world is not arbitrarily passing away. It is passing away because God is causing the systems of this sinful world to fall away. I'll make it plain for you. Would you take a job if the president of the company told you that the place was going to go under in less than two weeks? Would you get on a ship or a plane if the captain told you beforehand that the plane was going down? Would you buy a car from a used car salesman (laughs) if they told you it was a lemon and the engine was only going to last for a few days. You wouldn't do any of those things. So if you wouldn't do any of those things, why then would we devote our affections, our love, our passions to the things of this world which the sovereign God is acting against to bring to its knees? The sovereign God who declares the Grass withers, the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. My brothers and sisters, don't find yourself on the opposite side of the battlefield with the sovereign God. The first half of verse 17 has a promise for the world, but the second half has a promise for those of us who have the love of the Father. Those who have the love for the Father will not indulge the cravings of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Rather, they are the ones who do the will of the Father. And there is a clear contrast between what what God the Father has to offer and what the world has to offer. What the world has to offer is temporary. It is fleeting. 
But what God has to offer is the promise of eternal life. In contrast, the world is passing away, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. And the contrast is amplified in the original language. The Greek word translated remains is also a present tense verb, just like the verb for the phrase is passing away. But get this, it is not a future tense verb. It does not say that the one who does the will of God will abide forever. It says present tense abides. The abiding has already started and it continues throughout eternity. Eternal life has already been given to us, his beloved children. The promise of eternal life is not a future promise awaiting fulfillment. Rather, it is something that the beloved children of God already possess because the Lord Jesus secured it for us at Calvary. But this promise to abide forever is only exclusively for those who do the will of God, which raises the question, what is the will of God? And to understand that, To understand what the will of God is for his beloved children, let's take a look at our second passage. Flip over to chapter 4. And I am in verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is is love. My brothers and sisters, you must love God and you must love people. You must love God and you must love people. John addresses his readers as beloved. They are, of course, John's beloved, but they are also the beloved of their heavenly father. And John exhorts them to love one another because love is from God. John's exhortation to love one another is not an imperative command like his or his exhortation to not love the world in the previous passage. But it doesn't carry any less weight because of the foundation of John's exhortation. The beloved should love one another because love is from God. Love is from God. And those who show love prove by their love that they are the children of God. And those who show love prove that they know God in an intimate way. Those who do not show love prove that they do not know God. Because God's essence, his very nature is love. This means that everything that God does down to a fundamental and essential level is characterized by love. God's existence is a loving existence. All of God's works and activity in creation are done in love. God's justice is carried out in love. God cannot do anything unloving because it is contrary to his essential nature. But this raises another question. If God is love, how does God display this love? How do we know that God's essence is love in any objective or discernible way? Let's look at verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. My brothers and sisters, did you know that God loves you? No, really. Did you know that God, the triune God, the creator of the universe, he loves you? He really loves you. 
You are the object of his love. You are a member of this beloved community to whom John is writing. God loves you, and he loves you specifically. He loves you so much that he allows you to experience the love that he has shared within him, within himself, in his co-eternal existence as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 8 tells us this, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If God is love, and he is, then the ultimate revelation of his love, the ultimate manifestation of his love is in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's essential nature of love is manifested. It is made plain in his initiative to send his only begotten son so that you and I could have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, excuse my archaic King James Version language for a moment, but I love the translation only begotten because it keeps us in, in line, in step with the historic creeds and confession from early church history, but also the ambiguity of the phrase helps to communicate the unique and special relationship that God the Son has eternally shared with God the Father that no one else in existence has. Sometimes, I can't even imagine laying down my own life. But what does John 3, 16 tell, tell us? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Always remember, friends, beloved, that Jesus, Jesus died not for his friends, but for his enemies. Now, excuse my pop culture references. I'm a millennial. But I like the way that uh, the Christian rapper Andy Minio says this. He says it this way. For the sin that I committed should have paid that price. But I didn't because the father went and gave the Christ. What love is this to send his own to die for sin and take us home? Got me feeling good. Forget my feelings. And here's the line that gets me every time. When you heard a story about the hero dying for the villain. My brothers and sisters, get this, the gospel is the story about the hero dying for the villain. And guess what? You're the villain. You're Agent Smith. You're Sauron. You're the white witch. But instead of destroying us like villains and giving us what we deserve, instead of allowing us to pass away with the things of this world, God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. And in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now we are no longer enemies. We are sons. And if sons, we are heirs through God. What kind of love is this, my brothers and sisters? It should overwhelm us. It should bring us to our knees because the sovereign God, the triune creator of the universe loves us this much. My brothers and sisters, you are loved. Dearly beloved. Rick, you're loved. Stu, you're loved. Pamela, you're loved. Nathan, you're loved. My brothers and sisters, you are dearly Beloved. Hmm. 
Now, in our last two verses, we find the crux of the will of God for his beloved children. Let's look at verse 11 first. <clears throat> beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I like to wear baseball caps. I've always liked wearing them, even before I started going bald. So don't think I'm just trying to cover my bald head. That's not it. But I like to wear baseball caps, hats of all kind, really. And every now and then, uh, one of my sons uh, will get a hold of one of my baseball caps. And they'll start to strut around like it gives them significance. One day, my wife and I asked our sons why they like to wear my hats. And I don't remember exactly which one of them said it, but his response was, because my dad wears hats. What John is saying to us in this passage, in, in verse number 11, Beloved, if God has shown us radical love by sending his only begotten son, then we should want to show radical love to one another because our father does it. We should want to love and serve one another because our father does it. We should want to help one another because our father does it. We should want to support one another because our father does it. We should want to serve the poor because our father does it. We should love our neighbor because our father does. We should love our enemies because our father does. And we should love the church, my brothers and sisters. I think you get the picture because our father does. The will of our father is that we would love with the same radical, uncommon love that he gives us. But there is also a promise connected to our love for one another in verse number 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. John acknowledges that we cannot see God. No one at any time has examined him, you know, the way that we would, the way that we would examine something under a microscope. No one has examined him is what the original language is getting at. But the love of God accomplishes its ultimate goal when beloved brothers and sisters love one another. God's ultimate goal and the fullness of his love is realized when we love one another. And as I close, I want you to grasp what is being said here. Follow the pro progression of this passage. In verses 7 and 8, God is love. His very essence and nature is love. In verses 9 and 10, the essence of God's love is manifested in his sending of the Son. In verses 11 and 12, God manifested, God's manifested love abides among us and his love is perfected in us. Brothers and sisters, can you see the triune God at work here? The Father's love is revealed by sending the Son. The Son loves us by giving his life for us. And the Spirit loves us by abiding with us to bring about the perfection of God's love. So what's love got to do with it, my brothers and sisters? Everything. Everything. I want to close by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 the famous chapter on love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Grace and peace.